Adele, I just made you a co-host so that you could present. It looks like you're good to go. Um, feel free to take it away whenever you're ready. Thank you, Maddie. Can you hear me okay? Yep, go ahead. And the slides are displaying, correct? Yes. Thank you, everyone. Uh, my name is Adele Ferranti. I'm the Director of Workforce Development and Training Programs at NYSERDA. I've been at NYSERDA uh, over 30 years, and I remember when NYSERDA first joined NASIO many, many years ago. I worked with uh, Bill Valentino and other presidents as we partnered with NASIO on many efforts. And I'm excited today to give you an overview of our workforce development and training programs, focusing on what we're doing with contractors. All right, everything but advancing. I'm okay with that. Hang on. All right. So currently, NYSERDA has about $120 million to support workforce development and training across all sectors, across all technology areas. So while, again, I'm going to focus on what we're doing to support contractors, we are working in the areas of offshore wind, energy storage, energy efficiency, heat pumps, commercial uh, needs, residential training needs. We work with community colleges, technical high schools, trade associations, labor organizations. So our programs run the full gamut, again, supporting all clean energy technologies that uh, are within NYSERDA's portfolio and certainly focusing on energy efficiency, greenhouse gas emission reductions, building electrification. We really are trying to focus on how we eliminate barriers to uh, marginalized communities in, sport, in support of our Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. And as you know, and I don't need to tell you this, industry partnerships are key. NYSERDA works with businesses to meet the demand for workers and to support hiring and training on critical skills. We are not out there you know, asking for certain training courses for certain populations at certain times. We are responding to market needs and market demand and funding projects that meet those market needs and market demands. We have several programs uh, that are continuously open for the most part, but I'm gonna focus in on two key programs that have supported some of the projects that I'll feature that are supporting our contractors as they do home energy retrofits, as we think about um, new technologies, as we think of advanced technologies. All our program opportunity notices are referred to as PONS. It's just a competitive solicitation. And the one I wanna talk about is our PON 3981. It's really kind of our catch-all for all energy efficiency and clean technology training program development. Here's how we build training capacity. And there always has to be technical training in these projects. But at the same time, while we think about training new workers, for example, people with barriers to employment, people that are just new into the clean energy uh, sector, we can also support um, basic, basic training on soft skills, professional skills, technical training, job placement services. So we, we really run the gamut. And it, this PON supports training for new workers, as I mentioned, I'll go into that a little bit more, and existing workers. So if you're trying to upskill uh, existing HVAC workers, for example, we can provide that incremental training, technical training to, to upskill them so they're more co comfortable with heat pump technologies. Another great example, we've worked with the unions, the IBEW uh, or Elect International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers to integrate solar training into their apprenticeship programs, training on microgrids, advanced lighting, EV charging infrastructure, uh, development and installation so we can help train new workers and existing workers. And just back to the new workers, for us, it's, it's called career pathways. It's got to be a pathway to an internship, a job, which is the holy grail, of course, advanced training, a pre-apprenticeship or apprenticeship program. We don't just simply you know, allow training providers to come in and offer training to new individuals unless there's a connection to a business, an entity that'll hire them, give them an internship, again, place them into an apprenticeship program, and that's really key to us. Some of the eligible organizations are listed here, technical high schools, community colleges, trade associations, manufacturers, uh, folks that are working with engineering, procurement, uh, construction, operations, and maintenance, renewable energy service providers, project developers, as we think about offshore wind, large-scale solar, 
and training and job placement in intermediaries. There are sometimes opportunities to work with those individuals that are connecting training providers to employers. So the types of things that we can fund, our funding cap on this pond right now is $500,000 in NYSERDA funding. Typically we have cost share requirements of about 30%. If it is a project that supports new workers and the, the main intent is to support people with barriers to employment, the cost share can be as low as 10%. If it's a union led training program, cost share is 10%. We fund everything from developing and delivering curriculum, equipment, training equipment uh, purchases, which is a lot of times a, a real barrier for community colleges, for union training programs, training trainers, implementation of mentorships, internships, pre-apprenticeships, a little bit of funding for marketing and outreach, although we want the majority of our funds to go to the actual training, travel if necessary. So we really provide comprehensive funding in areas that really can support a training program from curriculum development through delivery, through placement into internships. So again, this is our pond to build up that training capacity. And I wanna give you a few examples that really speak to the type of training projects we're doing to support contractors. And again, these are contractors or projects that came to us in either a competitive solicitation or through another program I'm gonna talk about in a minute. And this is us meeting that business demand. ITEC is a training and education center in Rochester, New York. They were started by Isaac Keating by a contractor. They're a standalone HVAC and skilled trade training centers, and they train to various um, third-party accreditation such as PAHRA, Nate, Nora. Uh, and for our project, they're working with HVAC contractors and students to really teach them about HVAC and heat pumps. Our funding allowed them to increase the size of its mini split heat pump lab. Then they also built out a geothermal training lab to make sure their trainees can have access to equipment for hands-on training. Uh, they offer four courses that in, in our program. These are the four courses we're focusing on. Heat pump service, heat pump installation, air conditioning, uh, and geothermal, loop installation and service. In this particular project, the goal is to train 165 uh, participants. And the main goal for us is to really support these initiatives that can go on after our funding is gone. Something that's sustainable, building out those training labs, giving them the infrastructure they need to continue training. Another great example is the Healthy Home uh, Academy, which is located in Brewster, New York. They are recruiting trainees, mostly from disadvantaged communities, people with barriers to employment. They are providing them with technical training and employment support. I mentioned how important it is that people get placed after training, well, whether it's an employment or an internship or apprenticeship. But the goal here is to get them employed in the home performance and high efficiency HVAC industries. They have four different training tracks that we're supporting, HVAC and heat pumps, home performance, which is uh, building science, sales and HVAC and heat pumps is a sales course. And these courses usually run six to eight weeks. And then home performance project administration, people that are gonna administer these programs, whether it be in new construction, renovation work, focusing on building systems. This project is, is a great example of partnerships you know, with community-based organizations where we work with a lot of community-based organizations to recruit people for training, to screen candidates, making sure those candidates match the, um, or the training program matches the needs of those individuals that we're recruiting and uh, screening. And again, we're looking at their interests, their abilities, um, and making sure that they're gonna be well positioned for success. They have some hands-on training at their facility or on site in actual installations. And that to us is key, right? They're partnering with businesses doing actual installations and uh, they have counselors. A lot of our career pathway projects have counselors to help students get placed and help them once they're placed. Mentoring, sometimes we have job shadowing as elements in our project. We wanna make sure those individuals that are placed are successful, have opportunities for career advancement. So again, we're trying to make sure that we're with these programs and participants from the beginning to the end, and even once they're placed, to provide as much support as possible. At the same time, you know, I mentioned most of our training is done by third party uh, individuals through our competitive solicitations. 
when we see a market gap, we, we have an opportunity to fill that gap un, it, it, until it takes the market time to catch up. So we knew that we had to develop some new materials on cold climate air source heat pumps, sizing and design. We got a lot of good input from the market, from manufacturers based on what their training programs look like, what their gaps might be. So we developed a PowerPoint uh, slide presentation that can be used by uh, technical folks as well as folks that are not as technical. We have two different versions, which include the basic principles of cold climate air source heat pumps operation, help them do load calculations and why they're important for cold climate heat pumps, sizing and selection methods, system design, control strategies, and design recommendations. So again, we saw a market gap. Actually, we did this during COVID. We saw an opportunity to provide more training during COVID while some contractors were kind of waiting, waiting to get back into the field. And these slides are our basic slides. They're on our website. You can download them. They're not branded. We're looking for people to use them. We get feedback. And as we get feedback, we're able to modify them and keep them current. So here's an example of us reaching out to the market and giving them some uh, new training on heat pump for cold uh, climate applications. Another way NYSERDA can help contractors, we have so many ways, it's gonna make your head spin, I think. Um, we help them through our cooperative training program for manufacturers and distributors. So these folks are working with contractors. They can come to us and get cost share, cost uh, share funding from us for training for their contractors. Some of the training activities that are eligible and we funded already, installation training for eligible products, design training, sales. We funded mobile or portable training units where, where it makes sense for those manufacturers and distributors. Again, equipment is usually a big thing, looking for training equipment for hands out on training. And we've helped out, uh, build out some training facilities. We pay uh, up to 25% for training equipment. And that's, that's interesting. That's not normally the threshold. You know, Normally it would be our full 70% in one of the projects under the PON 3981. But here we're talking about manufacturers who have a lot of this equipment. They have access to the equipment. So we want to make sure our funds are used wisely. We'll fund up to 50% of the training activities themselves to deliver the training. And uh, each manufacturer and distributor is eligible up to 50,000 per year. Again, this is for very specific training that manufacturers and distributors come to us in a very simple application process and say, all right, NYSERDA, we need, need 40,000, we need 30,000. We're gonna train 100 people. We're gonna train 50 people. And this is what we're gonna do and how we're gonna do it. Another thing that NYSERDA is working on, um, we've established what we call Clean Heat Connect. It's a network of distributors and manufacturers that are working on expanding the adoption of heat pumps across the state. We have regular engagement with participants on strategies to build, boost up sales, making sure we're you know, doing what we can to keep installation quality at the highest level possible. We have resources, calendars of trainings, educational videos, and more on the initiative website. I've got the link here. I know Maddie's gonna share this presentation after uh, this meeting. So you can go to Clean Heat, Heat Connect. And then again, some of the different uh, resources we have are sizing and design tools, uh, training, We've done a, a, a kind of a, a drip or a slow and steady campaign for marketing, marketing and sales. We want to make sure that we're in the market constantly and not, you know, flooding the market and then disappearing from the market. So we're trying to figure out the best way to do that campaign. Uh, we have project sizing uh, checklists, maps to help people plan heat pump installation design for different types of homes, and links to our workforce development and training resources. Again, all those information, uh, all those resources are on our website, and we work closely with these heat, can, uh, clean heat connect partners to figure out what's missing, what what new resources we might need, and how we can help them grow the market as we all try to figure out how to increase demand, install systems that are going to be of high quality. I know some of the neat sizing tools are on that website. There's a commissioning checklist, so I encourage everyone to check out the clean heat connect resources. So I know I covered a lot, but that's really some of the things we're doing to build up the training capacity. At the same time, we have several programs to help employers. 
We're helping employers. I'm going to talk about the on-the-job training program in, in a little detail, but we help them through on-the-job training. We help them through our internship program, and we have a climate justice fellowship program. And I think the really neat thing about this is all those three programs, internship, fellowship, and on-the-job training, we're providing a wage subsidy. In the case of an intern, which is part-time, typically someone that maybe works a summer or maybe they're working over two semesters, we're paying um, 75 to 90% of their salary for up to 400, I can't remember if it's 80, I think it's 480 hours. It's on average four to $5,000 per intern. And really the goal is to get uh, young adults and recent graduates experience in clean energy jobs. And for be people with barriers to employment or from disadvantaged communities, they don't have to be a college graduate. We wanna make sure we can help everyone get exposure to clean energy careers. We funded somewhere around 15,100, I'm sorry, interns to date, uh, helping hundreds of clean energy companies hire interns. If you hire an intern and they work out great, you can then hire them full-time under the on-the-job training program. Again, I'll walk through that in a minute. Or you could hire them as a fellow. Our Climate Justice Fellowship Program provides salary of $40,000 a year to bring on a fellow for 12 months. 3,000 of that is reserved for wraparound services or support a fellow might need. At least 37,000 goes to salary. Companies have to provide comprehensive health benefits and some companies pay the fellows more. And again, I wanna point out that you could hire an intern, you can then hire them as a fellow and then you can hire them full-time under on-the-job training, combining these three programs, which as you might remember, I mentioned, it's about 40 grand for a fellow, another four or five grand for an intern and on average eight or 9,000 under the on-the-job training program. Again, reducing the risk to employers to hire new workers and make sure those workers are brought on to a job with a great training plan uh, and opportunity to excel. So under the on-the-job training program, and this is mirrored very closely with our New York State Department of Labor on-the-job training program. They actually help us co-administer this program, which works out really great. They can help businesses find employees, they help us vet employee uh, candidates. They help us review training plans. And we are providing a wage subsidy of 50 to 75% for four to six months. If it's a traditional worker with no barriers to employment, it's a four, a four month subsidy, 50 to 75%. And the 75% is for heat pumps or for people with barriers to employment. We have a higher incentive for heat pump workers right now. If you're from a, hiring someone from a priority population or a disadvantaged community, and for us, priority population is low income, formerly incarcerated, transitioning fossil fuel workers, workers, people with a disability, their incentive is for six months. So again, we're providing incentives for people to hire uh, individuals from populations that have been left out in the past and that may have barriers to employment. And in the case of the on-the-job training program, it's a wide range of technologies that are covered here. HVAC, building performance, building automation, solar, and it's typically large scale solar. Uh, I'm sorry, not this one, this is solar. Lighting, smart grid, energy storage, EV charging station, offshore wind and other clean energy technologies. So again, our way of helping clean energy companies bring on new workers, reducing the risk in some cases when demand for some of these technologies is not as strong or, or predictable and making sure those workers succeed. And even through COVID, and I'm shocked at this number, we've seen retention rates of about 70, 75% uh, in the on-the-job training program. So those workers are staying on. And that's not easy, uh, especially during COVID, as you might already know. One great example of a participant in our on-the-job training program is Fred F. Collins and Son. They do some really great uh, home energy retrofit work. They really looked at our OJT program to, to take a different look on how they hire people. They really are looking more at an employee, make, making sure they have a good fit, making sure they have something to offer. They're looking at their hobbies, their personalities, what, you know, what they want to do, what they want to do in their career to make sure they can be successful. Um, they hired 10 new employees uh, under our on-the-job training program as HVAC installers, service technicians. Uh, and installation technicians. They, um, Fred Collins is just so excited because those employees have become vital members of their company. They're, some of them have advanced very quickly. 
And uh, they're really excited, a good partner for us. And it's just one good example of us helping a company. And again, I mentioned our average incentive can be about 8,000 per worker. So that's about 80 grand to Fred Collins to hire 10 new workers, real money. And money that we hope that those employers use to attract new workers. Perhaps they can provide some sort of training uh, stipend. They can maybe give them a hiring bonus, maybe help them with college loans. So that funding helps businesses be a little more creative in what they're offering their new workers. Foment insulation is another on-the-job training success story. Uh, they do insulation, air sealing, and auditing in Binghamton, New York and surrounding areas. They've hired 29 new workers under our OJT program, seven interns. And again, if they hire an intern and they like them, they can then move them to full time under the on the job training program. As you see here, they've received over $200,000 in NYSERDA funding. Now, all this is going on as we're building up the training infrastructure, as I mentioned, from programs like PON uh, 3981. So it's all happening simultaneously. Again, we're trying to help companies as we build up that training infrastructure. And those are two great examples in the on-the-job training program. Another example of something that we took the lead on during COVID, we basically went, went to some of our training uh, providers under contract and said, hey, what can we offer these contractors who are sitting on the sidelines waiting to see if they can go back in the field? We wanted to quickly pull up some uh, or make available some online building electrification training courses. Stephen Winter Associates was under contract to us and had several courses on building electrification and they quickly modified them for us and we put them online and they're still online, they're free. We have a residential track on electrifying homes, heat pump design and best practices and high performance ventilation. Again, three different training uh, courses for the residential sector. And then we have four courses in the commercial multifamily sector. Net zero strategies, refrigerant management. So great courses online for, for New Yorkers free. And it's a great opportunity. I think we've trained over a thousand to date. Don't quote me. It, it was well over 850, 900 some time ago, but I, I think we hit a thousand. And again, it was just us being creative during COVID and it was a great resource and we've continued that. Some other unique projects. Um, the one on the left um, is a great building performance institute training uh, initiative that we partnered with National Grid, one of our investor owned utilities here in New York. And it's for uh, minority and women owned contractors, women owned businesses, or people that are hiring um, or training people from disadvantaged communities. And it's, a, it's an amazing program, it's very unique. So we're working with National Grid and we are reimbursing those trainees for their tuition to take the BPI courses and for their certification costs, 100%. So it's about a million dollar initiative. We hope to train uh, quite a few in this area. We'd love to see uh, other utilities partner with us to roll us out across the state for all the investor owned utility. And again, we're focusing on service disabled veteran owned businesses, women and minority owned business enterprises and people from disadvantaged communities. Another initiative that we worked on with our single family team is develop the new BPI site supervisor training, working with BPI and the industry to develop a new certificate and accompanying training to be for on-site installation supervisor. We saw that as a market gap. That certificate was designed to help demonstrate their proficiency in building science principles and for supervision. Uh, to date, 83 certificates were earned through the initial deployment of training. And again, we're hoping this training continues. We plant the seed, we build the infrastructure, and we're hoping the market really you know, takes that type of initiative and runs with it. So two other unique examples, and I told you I was gonna make your head spin. So, <laughs> um, please visit our web website. There's a lot more information on our website. Uh, there's you know, opportunities to look as a business, for as a job seeker, as a training provider. At any given time, we have about 100 training projects underway. One big area I didn't mention is, for example, we have a whole program dedicated towards building operations and maintenance training, which is really designed to serve large property owners, large building portfolios, training those operators across those portfolios. 
Uh, and in that case, we're, we're going to train up to 10,000 individuals. I mentioned the $120 million at the beginning. That's our total portfolio. That should take us through 2025. And um, the goal there was to train 40,000. I think we've trained or have uh, folks in process to hit almost 30,000 trained so far or in progress. So I, I, I think we're gonna exceed our 40,000 uh, train goal. So very excited to share anything else I could share with you, answer any questions um, and thank you for your time. Thank you so much for that. Um, if folks on the line have questions, please enter them into the chat or raise your hand. Um, I'll ask the couple that I have while folks are thinking. Um, and you know, mentioned head spinning. So I'm curious if you think that there, if there is a top one or two models that you think would be most valuable for other state energy offices as they're considering, you know, what workforce programs would be helpful in the deployment of these rebate funds. Yeah, you know, that's a good question. Um, as you think about these rebate funds, and I think about our best successes, I think the most successful projects we have is where we're integrating this, you know, building science, insulation, air sealing training, HVAC training, heat pump training in existing programs, right? Building it into a community college's, you know, energy and construction trades program, working with the unions to make sure that content is built into their apprenticeship programs or in their partners' pre-apprenticeship programs, working with the trade schools. For us, they're BOCES, Board of Cooperative Educational Services, or technical high schools or CTE schools, to get this curriculum as part of their routine offerings. Uh, I think that's you know, the best chance for success. And as I mentioned, the, the work we've done with the unions like the IBEW, it, it's really great because we're just adding content to an amazing five-year apprenticeship program and that's not a big lift. It's a very small investment relative to the reach after you've invested the money. Uh, I do want to give one quick example. We've worked here in New York with Hudson Valley Community College, and we started out with them years ago, and it was one of my first uh, solar electric training projects a million years ago. And they wanted to just develop a three credit college course on photovoltaics, solar electric. Then they did so well, they, and there was so much demand for it, they offered a, you know, a second course, second three credit course. They took the curriculum and they gave it to their professional development team on the non-credit side and offered PV training to contractors. They did such a great job, a few contractors became adjunct professors and they started teaching the courses. And they took those students out to their PV installations. Like I mentioned, one of the other examples, they were out in the field, doing real work uh, on PV installations. Later, um, one of the solar manufacturers came to Hudson Valley and said, hey, we'd love to partner with you. You're doing some great stuff. How can we build a training um, lab with you where we can bring in our distributors and our contractors for training once a month on the latest and greatest solar electric system technologies, on um, inverters, on roof, roofing uh, racking uh, technologies, roof racking, sorry. So we worked with them uh, to develop a mock roof that this manufacturer used once a month. And every time they train their manufacturers and dealers, Hudson Valley could send their trainers to the training. And all the rest of the month, the Hudson Valley students got to use the system. So just an example of how we did a little bit of work with a community college who really grew their programs. And now it's part of their uh, regular program. They had a one-year certificate on solar electric training and it's built into their curriculum. So just a, a good example. Yeah. Um, you have a question in the chat from uh, Kerry from Pennsylvania, and he's asking if any of your programs cover costs like childcare, transportation, and other costs to enable people to take advantage of these trainings. Yeah, great question. So our career pathway projects for new workers that I mentioned, they, they offer, I, I think I, I walked through kind of soft skills, professional skills, technical training, and we do provide funding for wraparound services. We've provided um, stipends. Sometimes it's just a cash stipend of $2,500, $2,000. It depends on what the proposer has asked us based on their audience. We have paid for driver's licenses to get driver's ed education course. We have provided funds for people to pay their parking tickets 
so they could have their driver's license and get it unsuspended. We paid for daycare, we paid for steel toe boots, uh, we paid for our work clothes. So yes, we absolutely have. Uh, I wish we had more money for that. And we're trying to be very strategic about, about finding additional partners here in New York State that have a lot more funds to do that than we do. Mm -hmm. Um, the next question in the chat is sort of open ended to all of the states that are on the line, but I'll direct it towards you, Adele, since you have the microphone. Um, and there's a question about how do you prioritize the content of your training? Do you focus on introductory trainings? Do you get into like the especially technical stuff? Um, the question basically boils down to the biggest bang for your buck. Yeah, I'll go first and I'll let you, your, your other participants answer. Again, it depends on what the market's asking us for and what they need. Typically with existing workers, it's it's more technical content, right? If you're gonna teach, teach an HVAC technician how to install, design heat pumps, it's very technical in nature. It could be an intro course and then maybe a more advanced course. Where we're talking about new workers, it runs the gamut. It typically starts at very basic level technical training. And ideally, we take them through a few modules where maybe it's energy auditing 101, energy auditing 201, and we get them to a place where they're comfortable for the job that training is designed to help them land into. So it varies and it depends mm -hmm. on what the market, what the market needs. Yeah. Um, if other states want to respond, please uh, do so in the chat. I'm going to keep going through the questions that are for you, Adele. Um, the next one is from Sydney. She says, you mentioned partnering with manufacturers. Have you found that there are specific gaps in technical training offered by HVAC manufacturers, or is there more of a need to train on the integration of building as a system approaches? Yeah, I think that varies. Um, a lot of the times when we get approached by manufacturers, they just really simply can't scale up fast enough to train more people. Uh, they seem to know their stuff technically. I think the one example I gave you on the content we developed for cold climate heat pumps, that was to address some of the gaps we thought we saw in the market with manufacturer training. And some manufacturers took that and ran with it uh, and others already covered those topics. So it, it varies, mm -hmm. but um, I think a lot of our manufacturers are really trying to build out more training capacity and they need money for building out training labs. Gotcha. Um, the next question is about one of your funding opportunities. Uh, Karen asks, will four-year colleges be considered if they are offering a two-year degree or workforce curriculum? Absolutely. If that's, okay. what the, that's what they need and that's what their, their audience wants and their students need and, and there's demand for it, we'll absolutely fund it. Um, the next question is, when working with recruits having criminal backgrounds, do you fund expungement clinics for those that are eligible? You know what? No one's ever asked us that before. I'm sure we would try to help out in any way possible. We have seen some interest in getting formerly incarcerated folks jobs, and we know there are issues with bringing them into houses and liability, and we've kind of promoted and, and tried to see if Technical sales or customer service representatives is an entry level for those workers, but we're looking at any opportunity to overcome those barriers, but no one's ever asked us that before. Um, there are no more questions in the chat, but people feel free to um, continue adding them. I have like a theoretical question for you, which is how do you balance the priority of funding programs that lead to jobs or internships or some variation on employment, how do you balance that with, you know, emerging markets and emerging technologies? Um, some of these states, you know, home performance programs might be new to their state or new to a specific area of our state. So how do you balance the need that you're building something out for the first time with uh, guaranteed employment? Yeah, that's a great question. And we wrestle out with all the time, right? We're talking about clean hydrogen now. And mm -hmm. how much do you invest in clean hydrogen training needs, which we know are on the horizon, versus yeah. the need for HVAC and energy efficiency technicians now? And it's interesting. When we put our first um, wave of offshore wind training funds on the street, a lot of communities downstate, because our offshore wind work is off Long Island, New York City area, a lot of people, you know, came running to us saying, we want to get involved in offshore wind training. We need those jobs for our 
our communities, our, the people in our communities that have been left out of the clean energy economy. And while offshore wind is exciting and we're gonna have a lot of new jobs, I'm like, hold it. Let's think about this comprehensively. We have energy efficiency jobs now. We've got HVAC installation jobs now. How can we help you think about this more holistically so we can think about the offshore wind jobs that are coming, right? Operations and maintenance jobs are further away than construction jobs. How can we help communities plan, you know, exactly what you said, Maddie, on the current yeah. jobs that are open versus the future jobs? And then again, it's really, what are the needs of your constituents and interest areas? So it's a challenge, it, it's tricky, but I think mm -hmm. as we think about um, the new jobs coming in, in New yeah. York related to the CLCPA, it's an estimated 200,000 new workers by 2030. Those are real jobs. And our priority has to be really making sure we have the workers for those new jobs, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, the, another question for you in the chat is from Julie in Michigan. She asks, how often do you meet with unions, the Department of Labor and utilities to discuss and plan your training programs? Great question. We probably talk to the Department of Labor once a week, if not more. We work with the unions quite frequently. We've been to their workforce summit uh, and constant, uh, constant communications with the unions. Um, we just had this very innovative um, request for qualifications. We're hot, we have hired labor experts to help us better work with the unions. We're calling them labor liaisons, help us navigate project labor agreements, help us navigate the language in our solicitations to make sure we're thinking about the needs of the unions as well as the communities, as well as our CLCPA goals. So we are in constant uh, contact with our stakeholders. I'd say in some cases, a weekly basis, other cases, monthly. Great, thank you. Um, any lingering questions from the audience, please feel free to either enter them in the chat or just to raise your hand and I can call on you that way too. If there are none, Adele, are there any final thoughts you want to leave us with today? No, I think this is an well. I, I think this is an exciting time. I think there are some great models out there that are worthy of consideration for easy replication. While we all know that there'll be new models that we have to develop to, to do things at a larger scale, so I'm happy to talk with anyone after this meeting to follow up. And if you have examples that you know we should learn about, feel free to reach out as well. I'd love to learn what we're not doing. Thanks. And along those lines, there is a follow up from Julie Michigan wondering if you're willing to share your RFPs for your training programs. Yeah, they're all on our website. If you go to the uh, workforce um, program pages, clean energy workforce and training program page, all our funding opportunities are listed there. Excellent. Um, and I'm happy to facilitate that connection. If anyone wants to get in touch with Adele afterwards, feel free to send me a note and I can make sure everyone's connected over email. Um, okay, with that, thank you so much for taking the time to present. I really appreciate it. Um, for our audience, thank you for spending another hour with me. I appreciate that too. Um, and don't forget, for those of you on the line, if you have responses to Nazio's RFI comments, please get them to me by the end of the day on Thursday. I will hit send on that email shortly. Um, thank you, everybody. Have a great rest of your afternoon. Thank you.